So, not too long ago, I did a review on the XB Pen product called The Artist 12, the second gen. It was an awesome opportunity and I had a lot of fun with it. It's not every day someone gets the chance to try something new and fresh, and it was definitely a first for me. Soon after the video went up, I had spent a while uh, scrolling through the comments and entries for the giveaway, and trust me, it wasn't easy. But it went okay in the end. Congratulations again to Georgie for winning the giveaway, and I'm ecstatic that you're enjoying it. That aside, XP reached out to me once again not too long after the giveaway and asked if I was interested in trying out another product, the Deco LW. And if you hadn't guessed yet, we're sitting here now, I uh, I said heck yeah. I mean, I didn't say heck yeah, you gotta keep a, you know, level of professionalism. So what exactly is the Deco LW? As you can probably guess, it's another tablet. And much like the previous product I reviewed, the Deco LW is also powered by the same X3 smart chip, meaning that the initial activation force is uh, about 3 grams. It's essentially the sensitivity and weight needed for a pen to be fully activated or to be sensed by the tablet. 3 grams gives the pen a lot of wiggle room to create either thin or heavy line weights. Unfortunately, the piece that I chose to do this doesn't really heavily rely on line art, unlike most of my other works, but that's okay. The tablet also has a 0.06 retraction distance, meaning that the pen nib won't wobble or wiggle as much when it's being used. The tablet is also well protected, and it has the implementation of two-shot molding, and if you don't know what that means, it basically means it's got double the security in its bolts on the sides. Again, it comes in different colors, blue, green, black, and finally, the one and only pink. But the most notable thing about it is the fact that it's Bluetooth. Yeah, Bluetooth. This specific aspect got me super excited about it and I had to sit there waiting for it to charge. But it is noted to have a battery time of 10 hours, so let's put that to the test. I wanted to do something super specific for this piece, so I sat there for a bit wondering what would be nice to draw. Then I remembered, ah yes, my old, old OCs. There wasn't much battle on who I should choose, for there was one clear winner, my beloved Moku. On my Instagram, I had this trend where at the beginning and at the end of every year, I would redraw Moku just to see how my art had progressed. This didn't really last long as with time, I kind of got wrapped up with other projects, different animatics, different videos I wanted to make, as well as like webtoons that I'll never finish. So I hope Moku takes this drawing as a piece of forgiveness. Moku's character originated from an AU a really good friend of mine had, where far into the future, the world was split up into different classes that specialized in different productions of an aspect of society. At this point, the world had gone through like one or two or three uh, apocalyptic situations. Yeah, I'm not too sure. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't exactly recall the nitty gritty details of the story since it was a heck ton of world building, but these classes were labeled A to E, and Mogu originated from E, which was essentially Oceana. Class E was an arid, isolated land, separated from most of the worldwide changes in the story. It's considered a lot older than the new classes in other parts of the world, and because of it, it's often ostracized by other classes. Moku, in this world, works a little bit like a delivery with her noble steed. With a bright personality and adventurous spirit, she's not too scared to venture wherever her next job takes her. Unfortunately, none of those jobs have ever led out of Class E, so the worldwide existence has always been such an alluring thing to her. Despite being mute, her energy is loud and boisterous, her friend and companion CG seemingly to be the only one who truly understands her. So as you can probably notice, she has a very peculiar steed. No, it's not a rat. In fact, it's a bilby. They're native to Australia, and I've only ever seen one once in my life in the wild, and honestly, I love them so much. They're adorable. If you've ever vibed on my stream or sat with me in a Discord for a prolonged period of time, you've probably, you're probably aware of my interest in biology, the ecosystem, all that nature stuff. It's always been a big interest of mine, and I'm fortunate enough to live in a country that has a very particular ecosystem. It's always a blast nerding out about it and learning about new things in general, so. Hence, why I would like to share some cool facts about these guys. Since almost every time I mention them somewhere on the internet, no one really knows about it. No one. It's always, it's always kangaroos, wallabies, wombats, and koalas. But I am here to bless you with new and wonderful knowledge. Meaning long-nosed rat to the Wallarai people of the northern western New South Wales, the bilby, scientific name Macrotus legotus, is a marsupial. 
And like most marsupials, they're nocturnal. They sport long, silky blue-gray fur and bushy tails with a white little tip. Technically, these guys are in a family of their own, but they're also considerably closely related to the paramephil... Okay. <laughs> Para... Paramelephil... Pelam... That's not even that hard. Param... Paramelomorphia. There you go, Paramelomorphia family, otherwise known as bandicoots. Some places calling these guys the rabbit bandicoots due to their visual nature. Much like kangaroos, they carry their young in little old pouches. Unlike wombats, who have reverse pouches, where it faces the back. They're weird. Sorry, I don't like wombats. Uh, for no particular reason. Uh, okay, I don't actually hate wombats, but you know, I hate wombats. They think they're so cute. I know what they're really like. Look, look I know what they were- I know what you are. Bilbies are solitary little guys that dig into the ground to create burrows that have been known to be beneficial to the general ecosystem, giving way to for plant diversity and often creating a safe haven for other species. Okay, kind of like a wombat's burrow, except you fall and slip into one of these things and, and they scar you for life and those wombats drag you down to hell with their grimy little- Much like kangaroos, Bilbies' youngs are called joeys. And while that's all cute and all dandy, the sad truth about most of the natural native species of Australia is that they're often very, very vulnerable. You see, Australia's ecosystem has always been so fragile due to its uniqueness. It doesn't help that in the past, settlers have carelessly introduced new invasive species and essentially have doomed so many of the species that used to roam these lands. Only naming some from, well, not the top of my head from the wiki. <laughs> the Paradise Parrot, the Woyley, Norfolk Triller, so many wallabies like the Banded Hare, Eastern Hare, Tulake, as well as a Crescent nail, ta nail Tail. And of course, one of the most notable extinct species the thylacine, more commonly known as the Tasmanian tiger. I'll be honest, the Tasmanian tiger in particular has always made me really frustrated and sad because I would consider it as a keystone species to the Australian ecosystem. This pretty lad being an apex predator that's super unique to the oceanic regions. Heck, it was and still is such an important key to indigenous Australians, Tasmanians, as well as the people from New Guinea. It would have been awesome to see these guys, but no, settlers had to hunt it to extinction, placing bounties on their hides, and for what reason? Well, because farmers would blame these guys for any attack on stock or farm, when in reality, Tasmanian tigers did their best to avoid humans. Recent studies and research showcase that these guys were no harm to the general populace. Okay, maybe like, one bite or something? I don't know. I wasn't there. If anything, it's highly suggested that the main aggressors for these disrupted farms were foxes. Oh, are they native to Australia? No, gee, I wonder how they got there. I digress. Every native animal and species within the Australian ecosystem is so integral to how it all works at the end of the day. And honestly, give me the time and day and I will prattle. I will continue to prattle. But that's not- wait, what does prattle mean? Hold on. Yeah, yeah, prattle. I, yeah, I know what that means. Anyway, but that's not what we're supposed to be talking about today. So now you know about Moku and Siji, and hopefully a little more about the Australian ecosystem, regardless if you wanted to or not. So, like, as I mentioned way before that whole talk, uh, this piece right in front of you is a lot more painterly than I'm used to. And honestly, it was a result of how um, new the Deco LW was to me. So, how did it feel using the Deco LW? Because I'm used to graphic tablets, it took a while for me to grapple with a new hand-eye coordination, and much like my last review, I battled the temptation and habit to use the tour box again instead of the buttons on the side. Luckily, I was able to situate my hands at a comfortable position so that I had easy access to the brush, erase, flip, zoom in, zoom out. Honestly, having to shift around my posture had me feel like I was drawing in a completely and entirely new way that I've never done before. Because I didn't feel confident in my line work just yet, I decided to take the painterly approach, and looking at it now, it's it's not that bad. Another plus side to all of this is because of the hand-eye coordination, instead of having to look down and crane my neck and probably put another kink in it, my vision faced the front. I stood in a straight back position, and I was arched over my desk like a candy cane. I really like the tablet, and the fact that it's Bluetooth, and only a few tools and tidbits to add to it, it makes it so much easier to, like, draw wherever I need to. Especially with my school laptop, because, you know, I'm not actually studying in the library. <laughs> now, would I suggest people to get this? 
If you don't already have a tablet that you can bring around with you everywhere, I would say if you have a laptop that you carry around all the time that has your drawing programs and everything, I'd say getting the Dego LW is pretty good. The fact that it's super small and sleek also helps a ton. And there's not a heck ton of tangling wires that you need to take care of or worry about. Much like the Artist 12, and I didn't mention this last time, but the embossed bits on the buttons make it easier to differentiate between what I'm pressing on. And uh, yeah, I, it, it took me a while to realize that, oh, I could just rely on my touching and feeling. But eventually I got there. If any of this has piqued your interest and you're looking for something to get for yourself or for a friend, anything you need to know is down there and for even more information, go check out the XP pen site. Overall, I would say I had a really good experience using this and I really like the color, the look. Overall, I really do like the color and the look. The Bluetooth is definitely the best kicker of it um, because I can move it around. No more tangled wires. Overall, I hope you enjoyed this video. It took me a long time to make because I got caught up with classes, assessments, other projects. I want to make more stuff like this. I want to talk more about my interests or like prattle on about stuff I find interesting and kind of put myself more on the channel. I'm really happy that you guys are here to watch the video and I hope to see you next time. I have a few other things planned. I always say that, but I do have a few other things planned for you guys. Stuff, some, some really cool things. I hope to see you guys next time and I hope you enjoyed this review.